I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of, the book of Romans, uh, chapter 12. And in Romans chapter 12, we're continuing on thinking about what it means to live lives that honor God, to live lives that are led by the Holy Spirit and that are putting us kind of right in the center of God's will. And so as we walk through the book of Romans, we discovered in the first 11 chapters over six weeks, we discovered this, that God wants us to know what we should be believing in. The first six weeks of the series was called I Believe. And the whole focus was on core beliefs of the Christian faith. The Apostle Paul, in those first 11 chapters, just walks through what is sin, what is righteousness, what is faithfulness, what's our source of peace and hope, what is salvation, and where does it come from, what is God's sovereignty. I mean, it's just core doctrines and beliefs, those first 11 chapters. Last week, we kind of shifted where that word, therefore, in Romans 12, 1, says, because all these things are true, therefore, live this way. Last week, we heard this, this, therefore. Therefore, I will surrender. I'll surrender to God. I, I will offer my life, my body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, because this is my spiritual act of worship. Paul says, lay your life down before the Lord. That's part of our response. He's been so good, we give him our lives. This week, we're focusing on this, this calling. I will serve. I will serve. With humility, in the name of Jesus Christ, I will find my place to serve. At Shoreline, we just took time and we cleared names off our church rolls of people who were here for like a military service and then they've moved and people who were here for college and we, people's names had gathered on our thing that are now no longer in the area, no longer part of Shoreline. We actually, I think in the last while, we've removed about 5,000 names that were part of Shoreline's community. We're down to just 11,000 now, all right? But I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine all around Monterey County and Salinas and Monterey and, and up to Marina and, and down towards Big Sur, all the places that are part of Shoreline. I want you to imagine if all 11,000 of those people every day said, Lord, how can I serve humbly like Jesus? How can I serve in my home? How can I serve in my workplace or my school? How can I serve in my neighborhood? How can I serve around this area? How can I serve in your church? If all 11,000 people who say Shoreline is my church home would find their place to serve, what would happen in Monterey County? You would feel it every single day. You would see a difference. And that's God's plan. Through you and through me to bring his hands of service to our community. So with that in mind, I want to invite you to listen as I read Romans chapter 12. Last week we looked at verses 1 and 2. And so today we're looking at verses 3 through eight. And I want you just to, to listen to these words, to read along if you have your Bible open, if you have your Bible app open. And I want you to just get a sense of, of this calling to serve and how clear it is and the heartbeat of it and what it might look like. So Romans 12, beginning in verse three. This is God's word inspired by his Holy Spirit. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, who does that leave out? Nobody. I say to every one of you, look at this attitude. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body, one physical body with many parts, many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body body. And each member belongs to all the others. Each member of the church belongs to all the others. And we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Now watch how straightforward this is. I love this. I love this. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in, line, in, uh, prophesy in accordance with your faith. If your gift is serving, then serve. If your gift is, if your gift is teaching, then Teach. It's really complicated, right? <laughs> if you're giving to teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Show that mercy with a cheerful spirit. God, we pray as we open your word today, as we dig into Romans chapter 12, that we will hear the call, not just a generic call, but a call on our hearts and our lives. God, we would dream with you 
That if the 11,000 people that are connected to Shoreline, that call this their church home, that in some way are part of the life of this church, if all of us would serve the way you call us to, with the gifts you've given us, we believe it would change the world, at least this part of the world we live in. So we say, Lord, speak to our ears and our hearts and our lives today. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to walk through this passage and we're going to let the Spirit of God unpack these simple truths that if we get them are transformational. Here's the first thing that we learn. And if, you're, if you have an outline, if you're here in the courtyard, you'll find the song sheet on the other side. It has a little outline for you if you want to take notes. And at home, you'll find those on the Shoreline app. And so here's, here's the first thing, the perspective of a servant. What is the perspective, what is the outlook of a biblical Christian servant? Meaning, if you're a Christian, you are called to be a servant, what should your perspective look like? So look with me at verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. He's not talking about saying, I'm worthless, I'm nothing, I have nothing to offer. It's actually just the opposite. He's saying the Holy Spirit has filled you with a gift, use it. But your attitude, your disposition matters. What's your outlook toward other people? How do you see yourself when you serve? Because unless you have the right perspective, you're not going to serve. We live in a world that says, you know, get yourself in a place where you can finally position yourself where everyone else serves you. And Jesus says, if you say, I'm a Christian, you have to say, I'm a servant. Why? Because God says this. He's made us to serve. He's designed us to serve. So there's a sense of humility. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. It doesn't mean think poorly of yourself, but it means don't become arrogant. Don't, don't believe your own press or the press that somebody else puts out about you. But say, ultimately, at the end of the day, who am I? I'm a servant of Jesus. And oh, be careful that you don't get in that position where, well, at work I'm in charge, in other places I'm in charge, so I'm, I'm going to look at other human beings this way. Uh, I, it's nice to see you people down there, you, the little people who are there to make my life better. Man, be careful of your attitude and your outlook. But when you understand that, that the God of heaven left the glory of heaven and was born in a manger humbly and died on a cross for you, and he's your example, and you follow Jesus, you go, oh, being a humble servant is really being like Jesus, which, by the way, that's what a Christian is. <laughs> Even the word Christian means little Christ. It means we're just trying to live our lives like Jesus. And then to be honest with yourself. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. Be honest about who you are, what your gifts are, how God has made you. And so here's the question for you. How do you view yourself in relationship to others? How do you see yourself in the way you view you and other people around you? Do you see yourself as a humble servant called by God to serve others? The church is the only place I've seen people who are business leaders and executives and people who live in fancy neighborhoods where they'll show up and they'll say, uh, oh, there's some on the floor, let me clean that up for you. And oh, there's kids that need help here, let me help the kids. The church people will come and humbly serve in a way that it'll happen almost nowhere else. And there are people who, who could... In, in the work world, pay someone else to do that, but in the church, they say, let me come and serve. We're, we follow Jesus. We walk in humility. We serve like him. And I, I learned a perspective as a young Christian uh, in, in the work world is what's my attitude in my work life? My first job wasn't really my first job because it wasn't an official job because um, I worked for 7-Eleven. I just stocked the freezer. My brother was the manager. My older brother, my, what I called my brother, the guy who lived with us was the manager. He hired me, but I wasn't old enough to officially work, but I stocked the, the cooler. But my first real job was Carl's Jr. At Carl's Jr. And so, and when you started working at Carl's Jr. back in those days, which is like a four, four decades and change ago, um, they, when, you, when you were new, you got two particular jobs and usually a third one. One of the jobs was you did dishes at the end of the shift. Number two was you cleaned the floor drains. And number three was you usually worked on the fry machine because that was great for your complexion. Uh, and so, but, but the, the floor drains were the worst because they were these white drains on the ground, they're sort of half out from the cabinetry and half underneath the cabinets. And during the day, they would just keep sweeping all of the sludge of the burgers and fries and drinks that got spilled. They'd sweep them into the floor drains. And a couple of times a day, they would have to be clean until they were shiny white. And the new person who worked there, that was their job. So when I first got hired, I got to do all those things. 
And the thing about the floor drains is you can't do it standing up. You have to literally get on your knees and look down and get, you know, first you have to clean out the sludge and then you have to kind of wipe it down. Then you have to scrub it and use a spray. And, and here, but here's the, here's the disposition that God had given me. God said, listen, all you do is for me. You're not working for Carl's Jr., you're working for me. So I, I clean the floor drains with this in mind. These are Jesus' floor drains. And I want them to look the best they can for Jesus. And when I wash the dishes, these are Jesus' dishes. And when I did the fries... Jesus must love fries a lot because there were a lot of them, right? And I, and I just try to keep that perspective. And after a short time, the manager came to me and said, I want to talk to you about being an assistant manager because I haven't had young people come in here and work like this. And I said to him, that's because I don't work for you. I work for Jesus. I, I just, I always say what comes to my mind. I've, I, I, did, I remember saying, I said, well, that, I'm, I'm, I'm working for Jesus. And he said, well, just keep working for Jesus then because this, this is going well. But I want to, I want to encourage you, whatever you do, I'm changing these diapers for Jesus. I'm loving my spouse for Jesus. I'm doing my job for Jesus. I'm caring for my neighbors, but I'm doing it for the glory of Jesus. And keep that in mind and do it with humility because he humbly took the cross for you and for me. And so there's an outlook. And, and, this, and, and what God is not saying is that you, you act, act humble because you're, you know, you're, you're, you're a worm, you're nothing, you're worthless. That's not the point at all. We learn from Scripture that we are called children of the living God, that we're saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, and he instills spiritual gifts in us. We are deeply valued in the heart of God, but our attitude should be that of being a servant. And not saying, I, I am better than everyone else. I'm sort of exalted and, and, and sort of special over everyone else. If you want a good thing, at, people at home, don't go look at this right now because you're sitting on your, watching on your computers probably or on your phone, but don't do this right now. But after the service, you could go look up a speech. It's a high school graduation speech. Just put in high school commencement speech, and the title is, You Are Not Special. It is one of the best. There's millions of views. Don't, don't look at it now, though. But, uh, but you are, it's, it's called You Are Not Special. And the whole point of this speech, it's a beautiful speech. And this guy says to these students, you need to know that you're not special. He's leading up to the end of the speech where he says, because everyone's special. You're not special better than everyone. You're special and unique, but everyone is. And it's just, but, but that should be our perspective. Wherever I stand in the world's eyes, I am loved by God, but I am called to be a humble servant. What's your attitude? What's your dis disposition? What's your outlook? Here's the second thing the Apostle Paul teaches in this passage in Romans 12. It's the picture of servant community. He gives this beautiful picture of what a community of servants, that's the church. We are a community of servants for Jesus. What a community of servants looks like. And here it is. Look with me at Romans 12, verses 4 and 5. This is the picture of a servant community. Romans 12, 4 and 5. For just as each of us has one body, that's talking about our physical body, with many members, many parts to our body, and these members not all have the same function. He says, now think about your physical body, has many members, many parts, they don't all do the same thing. So in Christ, we, the church, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. He's saying that the body, the church is like a body that fits together, and we as a church all have different functions, but we're all valuable. We're all needed. We're all valuable. Think about it this way. If someone came to you and they said to you, hey, do you have a pinky toe on your left foot? And most of us do. You might not, but most people do. They said, do you have a pinky toe on your left foot? And you said, yes, I do. And they, and they say to you, well, do you get involved with that much on a daily basis? Are you thinking about that pinky toe? Or are you, is it really kind of a big part of your life? And you say, well, not. I, I guess I don't really think about it much. And then they pulled out a pair of scissors. And they said, may I have it? That's gross, right? But I'm just, I'm, but you get, they said, may I have your pinky toe on your left foot? And you would say altogether what? No, it's part of me. It's important to me. I would feel it if you snipped it off. And I would notice it if it was gone. That's the church. Every part of the church matters. You are needed. You might say, I'm a, I'm a pinky toe. And we'd say, yes, and you're staying with us. <laughs> Every part matters. And they belong to each other. We are connected. Just like our physical, physical body is connected. Sometimes in our world we'll tell ourselves, well, I don't really matter in the church. You do. And for the church to be all God wants it to be means that we're going to unite together. And, and, so, and so we walk together. We're united together. And, and, I, and I, think about, uh, I think about my dad coming to know Jesus and how many people, I started thinking about how many, it's not thousands of people that were praying for my dad. It's tens of thousands of people over the last 43 years. With everywhere I've spoken, everywhere I've gone, I've asked people to pray for my dad. And I had people from Michigan sending me notes saying, I heard your dad came to faith in Jesus. I'm praising God with you. You know why? They've been praying with me for my dad for two decades. Sherry's dad and mom, Sherwin and Joan Vleen, have prayed for my dad every day since they met me. 
and heard my story of faith and my heart to see my dad know Jesus. And there, I, I will tell you, there's not a day they have missed for the, for the last, how long have we known each other? 38 years, right? Last 38 years. Sherry's parents have been praying for my dad. And now they pray for him every day to grow in faith in Jesus because he's put his faith in Jesus. Why? Because we're part of a family. Many of you, somebody just this morning said to me, there were, who was it? Somebody just this morning, I was talking to somebody, said, I'm celebrating that your dad, so here, yeah, that your dad came to know Jesus. I know that hundreds of people that are part of Shirley have been praying for my dad as, as the Lord has led your heart. We're in this together. We belong to each other. We are a body of Christ. And we have to understand that we're all valued. We're all important. You have something to offer that's unique and that's wonderful and that's beautiful. And if, we're, and if each person in the body of Christ isn't using their gifts, the church is not as healthy. I remember when my grandmother, my mom's mom, had a stroke. My mom's mom loved cats. She loved cats so much that she would walk over to Ralph's Market from her place in Pasadena. Both my grandmothers growing up lived in Pasadena. Jan and Dean, she's the little old lady from Pasadena. Remember that? Anybody remember that song? Who remembers that song? Okay, that's about my grandmothers, I thought, growing up. <laughs> it just happened. Both my grandmothers were in Pasadena. So my, my grandma would walk over to Ralph's and walk back home three times a day to get cat food. And, and she would then feed a little, give a little buffet for the local cats. She loved cats. And then she got a stroke, and half of her body didn't work. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think after the stroke... She could make it over the store, but it just took twice as long. She, couldn't, she could only go half as fast. No, her whole body was atrophied and affected by it. One half wouldn't work, but the whole body was kind of slowed down. The church is like that. When God's people aren't using their gifts and thriving the way God's made us to thrive, when we're not all serving in some way, serving in our homes, serving in our neighborhoods, ser- you know, ser- serving in our community, serving at the church, but if we're, if we're not all doing our part, some part to serve, the whole body gets kind of slowed down. So my, my invitation, God's call today is that all of us will say, God, what's my place to serve? Where do you want to use me? So here's the question. Do you see, feel, and embrace your place in the body of Jesus? Do you see that you're needed? Do you feel it, that you're important? And have you embraced and stepped into your place of ministry? I spent, th- this passage we're looking at today and three other passages, I, I, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4, those texts and what they teach, I spent six years of my life, six years studying those passages and one concept. This was, this was my doctoral dissertation. How do you build a healthy church around the gifts of all of God's people and not around the charisma of a pastor? How do you build a church around all all of God's people, each of us who believe in Jesus, around our gifts and our calling. And our, how do you build a church around all of God's people and not around a pastor? Because you know what? Pastors come and go, but the church goes on. Amen? And so, and so this is something I'm so passionate about. So do you see, feel, and embrace your place in the body of Jesus? And my hope and my prayer is that you will today. You'll recognize and say, you know what? I don't even know what my spiritual gift is or gifts are. I'm going to show up at one o'clock today. I'm going to join Sherry, and I'm going to learn. And I'm going to take this little assessment tool, and I'm going to figure, and then I'm going to say, how can I step into this? Some of you know your gifting, you're already engaged in ministry. Praise the Lord. Keep doing it. Here's the next thing the Apostle Paul teaches us. This is in verse 6 of Romans 12. Every believer has a grace gift, a gift of the grace of God. It's given by God's grace. That's why they're called the charismata. The word charis is grace. All right? So every believer has a grace gift so that they can serve for the glory of God and the good of the church. When you serve using the gifts that God has given you, it glorifies God, it blesses the church, and it overflows to the world. All right? God is overflowing to the world through Shoreline Church. This community is a different place because Shoreline Church is here and because you're part of Shoreline Church. And so we have to understand that each of us is gifted. Look with me at Romans 12, 6. And we read these words. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Each of us has different giftings. And we exercise those giftings in different ways. But here's the thing. If you came to the cross and received Jesus, if you say, I'm a Christian, then I need to tell you something. You have a gift. Even if you haven't figured it out yet. Even if you're not yet using it. If you're a Christian, you have a gift or more than one gift. And God wants to unleash those today. And I praise God for the the breadth of the different kind of gifts that we have. So here's the relational world I'm the closest to where I can watch gifts most, kind of most come alive. It's the woman I'm married to. I hang out with my wife a lot, all right? We, we, we like it after 36 years of marriage. We still really like each other. But we're, if you, anybody who knows us, we're a little bit different in some ways. 
like everything. And, uh, and so I'm going to tell, tell you one of the gifts that Sherry has and one of the gifts that I have. But I'm not going to tell you which one of us it is. And I want some of you to kind of think ahead and see if you can guess before I tell you, okay? It's going to be fun. It's going to be a little, little it's, it's, it's a part, you know, audience participation time, okay? Congregational participation time. One of us has a gift, the spiritual gift of compassion. And that person is sensitive and tender and feels deeply and responds out of a deeply compassionate heart. That's one of us. Anybody ahead of me yet? And one of us has a prophetic gift of speaking the truth with conviction and clarity and challenging people. Who thinks that I'm the one with the primary compassion gift? Just raise your hand. Okay, I do have some compassion, but who thinks it's my wife? Yeah, okay, so, so here's, the, here's, now here's how it works. Sherry has the gift of compassion. It just flows out of her. I'm learning to be compassionate. And you know who's teaching me most of that? My wife. So here's how something, this is really how things will go in my life. I'll interact with somebody, and I'll, I'll just tell them what I think, and I'll be really blunt, and I'll be really direct. And Sherry will say to me, out of her compassion, she'll say, you know, Kevin, you might, I think you might have hurt their feelings. You might have come along too strong. And I'll say, no, I didn't. She says, no, I really think that you, because she feels it. She sees it, right? So she'll say, I, I think you were too dr- you know, direct and blunt, and you might have hurt their feelings. And then I'll say something like, well, if that hurts their feelings, that's their problem. And she'll, and she'll say something like, she'll say something like, well, no, Kevin, you're a pastor, and you're a Christian, and it has to be your problem too. And then I'll say, well, then how should I handle it? And she'll teach me. Because I, I don't, it doesn't come, but here's the thing. Every Christian is called to be compassionate, right? I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm, I, I can show compassion, but she has a gift of compassion. I have a gift of, one of my gifts is sort of this prophetic teaching gift where I will share things with a challenge and I'll be very direct with things. And Sherry will sometimes say to me, she'll let me know if sometimes I'm being too direct and too blunt. And sometimes I'll be really direct and blunt and she'll, in her compassion, she'll say, Kevin, I think that was too, too direct and blunt. And I'll say, actually, I disagree with you. I think it needs to be exactly like that. And I don't always listen to her because sometimes out of my gifting, I have to operate how I am. But that's part of our journey. I praise God that we have different gifts that work in different ways and they work together. I praise God at Shoreline Church. I can look around here. I'm seeing people, I'm seeing people who, who have innovation gifts. I see people who have administrative gifts. I see people who have uh, intercessory gifts. I see people who have, have generosity. Giving is, generosity is a spiritual gift. I see people with generosity gifts. I see people with helping gifts who show up and help with all. I'm, I can look around here and many of you, I know what your gifting is. You know why? I watch you do ministry and I see your gifts at work. And so, and so will you just celebrate that each of us is different. Each of our, our pastors have different giftings, but they work together for the church. And many of you are, are thriving and using your gifts, and the world is being blessed because you're faithful in the use of your gifts. So here's my question for you. Do you know and embrace the gift God has given you? Do you know? Could you say, I know at least, I, I, can t- I have three primary spiritual gifts. I know what they are, and I'm trying to use all three of them. Do you know I have one or two or three spiritual gifts, and here's how I'm using it. And if you say, I don't really know, I couldn't answer that. One o'clock today, I challenge you to jump into that class and, and you'll get a whole new fresh perspective on yourself. And then when you see what your gifting is, you start to use it for God's glory. You humbly, joyfully use that gift. So if, if you're, maybe some of you are saying, I don't know really where to connect in ministry to use my gifts. I'll give you one example today, okay? At the back of our courtyard right here, so all of our folks online there, your camera's facing there, right behind the camera here is our food pantry and up there on the docks where we do our clothing closet. Let me tell you about how some gifts can be used in our food pantry and our clothing closet. Okay, this October, so it's November 1, the last month, this October was our biggest month in the history of Shoreline Church for giving out food in the food pantry. Now try to get your head around this. Your church, and many of you have been getting, your your financial giving and the food you bring and drop off here, we served this last month 3,452 men, women, and children right here on our campus who came in a time of need. That's eight times more than we did last year. Same month. That's how the needs have changed. And in Monterey, with people out of, so many people out of work with the resort industry, different things, there's been huge needs. And you need to know that when we give somebody, we give people physical food, physical bread, but we want to give them the bread of life. We want to give them Jesus. So every person who comes for food, we don't force them, but we ask them, would, would you, we, we say, we'd be honored if we could pray for you. Do you have anything we could pray for? Of those people that came, of the family units that came, 877 last month said yes to prayer. And in many cases had conversations about Jesus or about faith. And in many cases, we have people following up to try to help meet those needs. That's what your church is doing. 877 last month. Spiritual conversations and prayers right here. So that's exciting. That's incredible. But you go, well, what's that got to do with spiritual gifts? 
this, there's this, do you know there's a spiritual gift of administration? People have organizational administrative gifts. That's listed in the Bible as a spiritual gift. How do you collect food from 20 different locations every single week and then sort it and prepare it and get it ready? Someone organizes all of that. Some of you have administrative gifts. You can call the church. You can, call it, you can talk to Christy, who is the administrative person who leads all of our outreach, or you can talk to Pastor David. Just call and say, can I talk to the outreach department or to Christy or to David? And say, hey, I got some administrative gifts. Can you use me? Some of you have the gifts of helps. You know that there's a spiritual gift called the gift of helps? You know what that gift is? I'll give you the best definition. It's someone who likes to help out doing things but does not want to be noticed. You know, it's like, put me on the stage and have me speak. I would die. Let me just go and just do things that will be helpful to make ministry happen. I would thrive. We could probably use 25 more people driving right now. Our administrative people lay out the whole schedule who would say, okay, on Monday and Wednesday, we need somebody to go to, to Trader Joe's and to pick up these things and bring them over here. And it might take three trips to get back and forth to bring all the food. And we need somebody to go over here and pick this up. And we got this food bank here and we got this here. And we need people to do that. I, there's some of you that go, man, I'd love to do that. I mean, that, that's a spiritual gift? Yes. That honors God? Yes. That blesses the church? You bet it does. That changes the world? Yes. That's what we're talking about. Some of you have intercessory prayer gifts where you, you just say, you know what? I love to pray. You mean, you mean and when we open the food pantry, there's a line of cars out over here. And so our prayer people can go along and just say, hey, as you're waiting, just want to check in. Um, anything going on that we can pray for you for? And, and lots of people want prayer. And, and so we're having, we're, having, we're having prayers. We're having conversations about Jesus. Some, some of you go, I'd love to do that. Some of you have evangelistic gifting or intercessory prayer giftings. Those can be used right there in the food pantry. Some of us, we also have to, when all the food and clothes come, we have to sort them, clean them, get them all ready, bag them. We need people, I mean, there's all kinds of giftings that we need. And as that thing continues to grow, and I, I'm hoping with time that will actually decrease because the need goes down, but until it does, here's the, here's the deal. We're gonna meet those needs as a church and we're gonna do it prayerfully and we, we actually track who's here and we're really careful that, to not let people abuse it. We're doing all we can to be responsible, but also serving in the name of Jesus. And so there's ways to use your gifts. I encourage you to contact our outreach officer, talk to Christy and David, and just find out how you can get engaged and be part of that. And then the Apostle Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 12. And he says, use your gift for, the, for service in the power of the Spirit. As you serve, it's a spiritual gift given by the Spirit of God when you become a Christian. So use it for the glory of God, but use it in the power of the Spirit. And can I encourage you something? Use your gifting early in life. Don't make excuses for why you can't serve Jesus. I became a Christian when I was 15, almost 16. At 16 years old, I started using my gift of evangelism. One of my, 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 I have a strong gift in evangelism, and I have a gift in teaching, and then, then I have a gift that's sort of... A, a, the challenging, prophetic, challenging kind of gifting. But, but evangelism, I was 16 years old, a brand new Christian. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I, I knew the Bible only because that summer I read the whole Bible and I started telling everyone I knew about Jesus. I didn't wait till I was 18, really old at 18 or 20 or 25. I started talking about Jesus because actually God's called me as an evangelist. That's part of my gifting. And then at 17 years old, the youth leader at the church said, can I start training you to be a teacher in the, in the, in the, in the student ministries? And at 17, I started being trained to use my teaching gift. Praise God. That's a gift I've been using ever since I was 17 years old. But somebody noticed it and called me out. So for, there's a lot of Christians who say, well, I'm waiting to use my gift for the right time. I'm waiting until I'm mature enough. Can I tell you, when I was 16 and 17, I wasn't very mature. There's still moments where some people wonder if I'm very mature now. All right? I mean, I'm still a kid at heart, right? But, but if, if you're waiting for the right moment to step in and start using your gifts for God's glory? Everybody look at me. This is the right moment. <laughs> can, I, can I exercise my prophetic gift? It's the moment. The world needs what the church can bring. The church needs what you can bring to the world. So step in. Don't wait for the right moment. It's always the right moment. Don't wait. Romans 6, verses 6 to 8. I mean, Romans 12, verses 6 to 8 says this. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, don't have a crummy attitude. Do it cheerfully if you're showing mercy. Live it out. Discover your gift. Find your place. And can I tell you something? When I was 16 to 17 years old, the first time I used this gift of sharing faith and told someone about Jesus, the first time that somebody said, 
I want to know Jesus too. And they prayed to receive Jesus. There's nothing like it to feel God go through you and bless someone else. The first time I got up and teach, taught at 17 years old, other high school kids, and as I opened this book, this living word of God, and spoke the truth of God, and I saw people nod their heads, and I saw their hearts being changed, and they lived more for Jesus. I said, God, there's nothing better than feeling the Holy Spirit of God work through you and bless someone else. The first time you show up and help and someone, you use a helping gift, and you set up, and you tear down, and you, and you do this, and you sort that, and then you see somebody come and be blessed, and you go, you stand back quiet, and you go, I was part of that. The God of heaven used me to touch someone's life. God used me? Yeah. There's nothing like it. Don't miss out. And don't wait till whatever that moment is, you think, okay, someday at some time, I'll jump in. Find your place as soon as you can and live it out all the days of your life. Here's the final question. How can you step into the joy of God's will to use you to change the world? What's your step? Discover that gift. If you don't know, one o'clock today, jump in. If you can't do it, then call the church and we'll find a time to get you connected. We want to make sure everyone has that opportunity. But to find your place and to use your gift. And can I tell you that very beginning part about just humbly, humbly, humbly. When God uses you, you get the joy, but he gets the glory. And all of heaven looks and sees the God of the universe pouring through ordinary people. That's all all of us are who humbly follow Jesus. And God pours through us and the world is changed and our world needs some changing right now. I believe the only way it's really gonna happen is through the church. I grow more and more convinced of that as the years go by. So Jesus, this is our prayer. Here we are, Lord. You tell us in your word you've gifted every one of us. You tell us that's true. You tell us that your Holy Spirit has imparted a gifting that we can discover and develop and use for your glory. We say, Lord, we're in. We'll take that step. We'll take our next step. Lord, for those that are faithfully serving, using their spiritual gifts, let them feel that joy of seeing you pour through them and let them continue on that path. For those that are hungry and curious, I pray they'll take the next step. And Lord, when we humbly serve, in the church, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our schools, anywhere we go, unleash your power and bring glory to Jesus. We pray in his name and everyone at home and in the courtyard in their cars said, amen, amen. amen. Before I send you out with a word of blessing, let me give you a couple quick, uh, quick things to be aware of. Number one, this Wednesday, best Wednesday of the year. Uh, and, I, I, and, and you know what? No matter what happens on Tuesday or in the next week or month or whatever it takes, we need to gather and worship Jesus. So we're, we're doing night of worship at 6.15 here on campus and online. You don't have to, you, but, but if you want to be on campus here, it's going to be at 6.15, which means now, remember, it gets dark at three in the afternoon now. So, uh, <laughs> oh, this part of the year is hard for me, people. Um, I like when it stays light till nine at night, but it gets dark, you know, before 6.15. So pretend it's Monterey and you need seven layers of clothes everywhere you go. Everybody know what I'm talking about? So bring a blanket, bring a, a quilt, bring a, a, a sweater, uh, come in your shorts and t-shirt if it's warm, but it could be drop 20 degrees. Come ready, register. We're meeting online and also on campus this Wednesday night, night of worship, 6.15. You'll want to be there, so be part of that. If you need prayer right now, if you're online, right there you see online, there's an email address. Would you just send a note to that address and someone wants to pray with you right now? And if you're here on the campus, Pastor Dennis is right back here up the stairs and up, up to, the, to the dock up there and Pastor Dennis is up there to pray for you on campus here. If you're new at Shoreline, if you're online and you're new, there's a phone number right there on your screen. Will you text the word welcome to that number? And they're gonna send you a digital connection card so we can get to know you. And they wanna thank you for joining us and just build a bridge. And if you're on the campus here or in your car, you can just go right over to the booth in the back here that has balloons and a big sign that says welcome and Patty's smiling face. She has a gift bag for you that she will hand to you with a glove on and it's been nice and sanitized, but it's a nice little gift for you. And we wanna give you a warm personal welcome over there. And then also, again, I, did I mention there's a class at 1 o'clock today? Did I mention that? Is this important? Yes. 1 o'clock today, a joint share for the Spiritual Gifts class. There's a link on the front of our website. And now, as you walk into the rest of this week, whether you're at home, here in the courtyard, over here, getting ready to roll out of here, we're glad you're here. God bless all of you. As you go through this week, will you understand that the God of the universe, the moment you said yes to Jesus, he gave you a gift. Will you discover it? 
Will you offer it back to him? Will you use it for his glory and find the joy of God pouring through you and changing the world around you? God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you right back here next Sunday as we continue through Romans. God bless you. Have a great week. And Oh, and then just pop your mask back on before you walk out and make sure our ushers are going to come and dismiss you. And so we have not had one uh, accusation or reality of any case of COVID, any spread, anything here. So let's keep it that way. So just pop your masks up and you'll stay where you are and someone will come dismiss you. God bless you. Have a great day. And at home, God bless you.